Mechanical Ventilation, Wikipedia Article Audio A endotracheal tube, which sits in the trachea B inflatable cuff, which facilitates the inflation of the balloon at the end of the tube to allow it to sit securely in the airway The balloon can also be deflated via this cuff upon extubation C trachea Uses Associated risk Complications Application and duration Negative pressure machines Positive pressure Trans airway pressure Intermittent abdominal pressure ventilator Types of ventilators Mechanical ventilators Breath delivery Trigger Cycle Limit Breath exhalation Dead space Modes of ventilation Modification of settings Weaning from mechanical ventilation Respiratory monitoring Artificial airways as a connection to the ventilator Ventilation formulas History Mechanical ventilation is the medical term for artificial ventilation where mechanical means is used to assist or replace spontaneous breathing. This may involve a machine called a ventilator or the breathing may be assisted by an anesthesiologist. Certified Registered Nurse Anesthetist, Physician, Physician Assistant, Respiratory Therapist, Paramedic, EMT, or other suitable person compressing a bag or set of bellows. Mechanical ventilation is termed invasive if it involves any instrument penetrating the trachea through the mouth, such as an endotracheal tube or the skin, such as a tracheostomy tube. There are two main types. Positive pressure ventilation, where air is pushed into the trachea, and negative pressure ventilation, where air is, in essence, sucked into the lungs. There are many modes of mechanical ventilation, and their nomenclature has been revised over the decades as the technology has continually developed. Mechanical ventilation is indicated when the patient's spontaneous ventilation is inadequate to maintain life. It is also indicated as prophylaxis for imminent collapse of other physiologic functions, or ineffective gas exchange in the lungs. Because mechanical ventilation serves only to provide assistance for breathing and does not cure a disease, the patient's underlying condition should be correctable and should resolve over time. In addition, other factors must be taken into consideration because mechanical ventilation is not without its complications. In general, mechanical ventilation is instituted to correct blood gases and reduce the work of breathing. Common medical indications for use include Barotrauma pulmonary barotrauma is a well-known complication of positive pressure mechanical ventilation. This includes pneumothorax, subcutaneous emphysema, pneumomediastinum, and pneumoperitoneum. Ventilator-associated lung injury Ventilator-associated lung injury refers to acute lung injury that occurs during mechanical ventilation. It is clinically indistinguishable from acute lung injury or acute respiratory distress syndrome. Diaphragm-controlled mechanical ventilation may lead to a rapid type of disuse atrophy involving the diaphragmatic muscle fibers, which can develop within the first day of mechanical ventilation. This cause of atrophy in the diaphragm is also a cause of atrophy in all respiratory-related muscles during controlled mechanical ventilation. Motility of mucocilia in the airways Positive pressure ventilation appears to impair mucociliary motility in the airways. Bronchial mucus transport was frequently impaired and associated with retention of secretions and pneumonia. Mechanical ventilation is often a life-saving intervention, 
but carries potential complications including pneumothorax, airway injury, alveolar damage, and ventilator-associated pneumonia. Other complications include diaphragm atrophy, decreased cardiac output, and oxygen toxicity. One of the primary complications that presents in patients mechanically ventilated is acute lung injury slash acute respiratory distress syndrome. Alley slash arts are recognized as significant contributors to patient morbidity and mortality. In many healthcare systems, prolonged ventilation as part of intensive care is a limited resource. It is used to support a single failing organ system and cannot reverse any underlying disease process. For this reason, there can be decisions to be made about whether it is suitable to commence someone on mechanical ventilation. Equally many ethical issues surround the decision to discontinue mechanical ventilation. It can be used as a short-term measure, for example during an operation or critical illness. It may be used at home or in a nursing or rehabilitation institution if patients have chronic illnesses that require long-term ventilatory assistance. Due to the anatomy of the human pharynx, larynx, and esophagus and the circumstances for which ventilation is needed, additional measures are often required to secure the airway during positive pressure ventilation in order to allow unimpeded passage of air into the trachea and avoid air passing into the esophagus and stomach. The common method is by insertion of a tube into the trachea, intubation, which provides a clear route for the air. This can be either an endotracheal tube, inserted through the natural openings of mouth or nose, or a tracheostomy inserted through an artificial opening in the neck. In other circumstances simple airway maneuvers, an oropharyngeal airway or laryngeal mask airway may be employed. If the patient is able to protect his slash her own airway and non-invasive ventilation or negative pressure ventilation is used then an airway adjunct may not be needed. The Iron Lung also known as the Drinker and Shaw Tank, was developed in 1929 and was one of the first negative pressure machines used for long-term ventilation. It was refined and used in the 20th century largely as a result of the polio epidemic that struck the world in the 1940s. The machine is, in effect, a large elongated tank, which encases the patient up to the neck. The neck is sealed with a rubber gasket so that the patient's face are exposed to the room air. While the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the bloodstream and the pulmonary airspace works by diffusion and requires no external work, air must be moved into and out of the lungs to make it available to the gas exchange process. In spontaneous breathing, a negative pressure is created in the pleural cavity by the muscles of respiration, and the resulting gradient between the atmospheric pressure and the pressure inside the thorax generates a flow of air. In the iron lung by means of a pump, the air is withdrawn mechanically to produce a vacuum inside the tank, thus creating negative pressure. This negative pressure leads to expansion of the chest, which causes a decrease in intrapulmonary pressure, and increases flow of ambient air into the lungs. As the vacuum is released, the pressure inside the tank equalizes to that of the ambient pressure, and the elastic coil of the chest and lungs leads to passive exhalation. However, when the vacuum is created, the abdomen also expands along with the lung, cutting off venous flow back to the heart leading to pooling of venous blood in the lower extremities. There are large portholes for nurse or home assistant access. The patients can talk and eat normally, and can see the world through a well-placed series of mirrors. Some could remain in these iron lungs for years at a time quite successfully. Today, negative pressure mechanical ventilators are still in use 
notably with the polio wing hospitals in England such as St. Thomas's Hospital in London and the John Radcliffe in Oxford. The prominent device used is a smaller device known as the cuirass. The cuirass is a shell-like unit, creating negative pressure only to the chest using a combination of a fitting shell and a soft bladder. Its main use is in patients with neuromuscular disorders that have some residual muscular function. However, it was prone to falling off and caused severe chafing and skin damage and was not used as a long-term device. In recent years this device has resurfaced as a modern polycarbonate shell with multiple seals and a high-pressure oscillation pump in order to carry out biphasic cuirass ventilation. The design of the modern positive pressure ventilators were based mainly on technical developments by the military during World War II to supply oxygen to fighter pilots in high altitude. Such ventilators replaced the iron lungs as safe endotracheal tubes with high volume slash low pressure cuffs were developed. The popularity of positive pressure ventilators rose during the polio epidemic in the 1950s in Scandinavia and the United States and was the beginning of modern ventilation therapy. Positive pressure through manual supply of 50% oxygen through a tracheostomy tube led to a reduced mortality rate among patients with polio and respiratory paralysis. However, because of the sheer amount of manpower required for such manual intervention, mechanical positive pressure ventilators became increasingly popular. Positive pressure ventilators work by increasing the patient's airway pressure through an endotracheal or tracheostomy tube. The positive pressure allows air to flow into the airway until the ventilator breath is terminated. Then, the airway pressure drops to zero, and the elastic recoil of the chest wall and lungs push the tidal volume the breath out through passive exhalation. Another type is the intermittent abdominal pressure ventilator that applies pressure externally via an inflated bladder, forcing exhalation, sometimes termed exufflation. The first such apparatus was the Bragg Paul Pulsator. The name of one such device, the Pneumobelt made by Puritan Bennett has to a degree become a generic name for the type. Ventilators come in many different styles and method of giving a breath to sustain life. There are manual ventilators such as bag valve masks and anesthesia bags that require the users to hold the ventilator to the face or to an artificial airway and maintain breaths with their hands. Mechanical ventilators are ventilators not requiring operator effort and are typically computer controlled or pneumatic controlled. Mechanical ventilators typically require power by a battery or a wall outlet though some ventilators work on a pneumatic system not requiring power. The trigger is what causes a breath to be delivered by a mechanical ventilator. Breaths may be triggered by a patient taking their own breath, a ventilator operator pressing a manual breath button, or by the ventilator based on the set breath rate and mode of ventilation. The cycle is what causes the breath to transition from the inspiratory phase to the exhalation phase. Breaths may be cycled by a mechanical ventilator when a set time has been reached, or when a preset flow or percentage of the maximum flow delivered during a breath is reached depending on the breath type and the settings. Breaths can also be cycled when an alarm condition such as a high pressure limit has been reached which is a primary strategy in pressure-regulated volume control. Limit is how the breath is controlled. Breaths may be limited to a set maximum circuit pressure or a set maximum flow. Exhalation in mechanical ventilation is almost always completely passive. The ventilator's expiratory valve is opened an expiratory flow is allowed until the baseline pressure is reached. Expiratory flow is determined by patient factors such as compliance and resistance. 
Mechanical dead space is defined as the volume of gas breathed again as the result of use in a mechanical device. Vd, m, e, c, h, equals, v, t, vd, p, h, y, s, p, a, c, o, 2, v, t, vd, vd, m, e, c, h, p, a, c, o, 2, equals v, v. V D V T equals P A C O two P E C O two P A C O two equals P C O. Mechanical ventilation utilizes several separate systems for ventilation referred to as the mode. Modes come in many different delivery concepts but all modes fall into one of three categories, volume cycled, pressure cycled, spontaneously cycled. In general, the selection of which mode of mechanical ventilation to use for a given patient is based on the familiarity of clinicians with modes and the equipment availability at a particular institution. In adults when 100% oxygen is used initially, it is easy to calculate the next phi O, 2 to be used and easy to estimate the shunt fraction. The estimated shunt fraction refers to the amount of oxygen not being absorbed into the circulation. In normal physiology, gas exchange occurs at the level of the alveoli in the lungs. The existence of a shunt refers to any process that hinders this gas exchange, leading to wasted oxygen inspired and the flow of unoxygenated blood back to the left heart. Acute lung injury, apnea with respiratory arrest, including cases from intoxication, acute severe asthma, requiring intubation, Acute on chronic respiratory acidosis most commonly with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and obesity hypoventilation syndrome. Acute respiratory acidosis with partial pressure of carbon dioxide 50 mmHg and pH 105 breath slash min slash L was associated with weaning failure while a RSBI 105 breath slash min slash L predicted weaning success with a sensitivity, specificity, positive. Predictive value and negative predictive value of 97%, 64%, 78%, 95% respectively. One of the main reasons why a patient is admitted to an ICU is for delivery of mechanical ventilation. Monitoring a patient in mechanical ventilation has many clinical applications, enhance understanding of pathophysiology, aid with diagnosis, guide patient management, avoid complications, and assessment of trends. In ventilated patients, Pulse oximetry it is commonly used when titrating FiO2. A reliable target of SpO2 is greater than 95%. Different strategies exist to find the level of PEEP in these patients with ARDS guided by esophageal pressure, stress index, static airway pressure volume curve. In such patients, some experts recommend limiting PEEP to low levels. In patients who have diffused loss of aeration PEEP can be used provided it does not cause the plateau pressure to rise above the upper inflection point. Most modern ventilators have basic monitoring tools. There are also monitors that work independently of the ventilator which allow for measuring patients after the ventilator has been removed, such as a T-tube test. There are various procedures and mechanical devices that provide protection against airway collapse, air leakage, and aspiration. The following formulas are used to calculate certain aspects of ventilation. The Greek physician Galen may have been the first to describe mechanical ventilation, if you take a dead animal and blow air through its larynx, 
you will fill its bronchi and watch its lungs attain the greatest distension. Vesalius II describes ventilation by inserting a reed or cane into the trachea of animals. In 1908 George Poe demonstrated his mechanical respirator by asphyxiating dogs and seemingly bringing them back to life. 